when I started teaching Ukraine, Ukrainian history in British universities, I had to begin by pointing the country out on the map. Some students knew that it was somewhere in this post-Soviet space, this mysterious land with no clear identity. Some thought that it had been part of Russia, because the USSR and Russia continue to be used interchangeably. Most wouldn't be able to locate it on the map at all. This invisibility, or as Cambridge scholar Rory Finnan calls it, reversed hallucination, that is not seeing something that is staring you in the face, meant that for much of the world, Ukraine was not a country, but a territory, um, a land that could be fought over, divided, and controlled by others, a sort of buffer zone. Since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion, Ukraine's map became familiar the world over, as it frequently appeared on international news channels. Reporters started to pronounce the names of Ukrainian cities more or less correctly, and finally gave up on the Russian spelling of Ukrainian place names, replacing it with Ukrainian transliteration. I assume that's happened in, Nor in Norway too. There is one man, however, who continues to struggle to find Ukraine on the map. Uh, in this video, taken not so long ago, the Russian president could be seen examining a 17th century map brought to him by the chairman of Russia's constitutional court to supposedly prove that Ukraine didn't exist at the time. The choice of using the map made by a cartographer for Francis King Louis XIV for this purpose is peculiar because the document, as you can see, in fact does show a place labeled as Ukraine or the land of Cossacks. While these days, the Russian president's cartographic and historiographical skills make him the laughing stock of the world, even 19 months ago, they were taken seriously by the media who preferred to report on Ukraine's affairs from Moscow, by the politicians who would rather do business with Russia and leave the small countries in its neighborhood firmly in a sphere of influence, and by the academia whose Slavonic and East European studies around the world were for most part actually the studies or the centers for the study of Russia. As Russia started to erase Ukrainian cities and villages it managed to occupy, as it brought chaos not only to Ukraine but to Europe as a whole, people around the world discovered Ukraine on the actual map and started to place it on their mental maps. However, visibility alone does not lead to understanding. It is only through exploring the country's history, culture, and its place in the global context that we can understand why Russia is so keen to make us believe that Ukraine never existed in the past and why it's waging a genocidal war trying to ensure that it won't exist in the future. Without Ukraine, Russia is no longer an empire. Without at least a pretense to imperialism, there is no claim to greatness. The greatness that the corrupt Kremlin elites have been feeding its citizens as they steal from their people, leaving them utterly impoverished, but with a sense of some illusory importance. Denial of Ukraine's existence as a sovereign state and the attempts to destabilize it at all costs is a pragmatic decision for the leaders of the Russian Federation to keep themselves in power. History was simply used as a tool in this desperate attempt to hold on to power. Instrumentalized history has been one of Vladimir Putin's weapons of war directed at the international community, at us in London, Washington, perhaps here in Oslo too. It was meant to persuade the rest of the world that Ukraine was not worth fighting for, that it had no sense of self, no culture, no traditions, no history of its own. History thus became a casualty and a weapon of war in Vladimir Putin's hands. He has treated the medieval prince Volodymyr, who baptized the inhabitants of Rus as Christians, as if he were one of the present-day politicians sitting across the infamous long table in the Kremlin. Of course, if you know the history of Rus, you will know that it was inhabited by Slavs and ruled by a group of Vikings with a capital in Kyiv long before Moscow existed. And you will also know just how absurd it is to use the historical nar narratives about the ninth century in order to justify Russia's contemporary warmongering. And yet, these narratives have been so frequently entertained not only by the commentators in the media, but even by professional historians. But while we spend our time and energy on constantly debunking Russia's historical myths, we lose sight of the main problem. 
Even if Ukraine dropped from the sky in 1991, no one should have been allowed to violate its borders, first in 2014 and then again in 2022. For over 19 months, Ukrainians have been struggling to survive Russia's genocidal war. At the same time, they have been forced to continuously prove their existence as a nation. There should be no need to prove that Ukraine has the right to exist. Ukraine exists, and no one has the right to deny that existence. So in the remaining time that I've got, I'd like to focus on several moments in history that, in my view, have shaped Ukrainians into the nation that is being discovered by the world today. I will also try to outline some lessons we could potentially learn from history to understand Russia's war in a more nuanced way. For more than a century before the First World War, the Ukrainian lands were split between two empires. The western parts were controlled by the Austrians and the rest ruled by the Russians. The ruling powers took different approaches. The Habsburgs were less prepared to resort to outright repression. The Tsars experimented with a variety of ways of eliminating Ukrainian uh, national self-expression, such as banning Ukrainian language publications, prohibiting Ukrainian cultural societies, and exiling or imprisoning in subordinate elites. Most importantly, they kept the vast majority of the population in poverty, depriving them of education and social mobility. Nevertheless, this period was important for efforts to forge Ukrainian identity. In the absence of an independent state, writers and poets and artists became the figures who shaped national identity, which was then deepened through community organizations and aimed at uh, national consciousness raising. Some of the greatest examples of Ukrainian literature were written in this period, including the fiery poetry of Taras Shevchenko whose lines are recited as a mantra by civilians and soldiers in Ukraine today. In the wake of the collapse of the Russian Empire um, and before the Soviet Union took shape, Ukrainians got a brief taste of statehood, further strengthening their sense of national belonging. This period is mostly known around the world as the Russian Civil War, but what was happening on the territory of contemporary Ukraine was Ukrainian revolution and several attempts at establishing Ukrainian statehood. This period of state building attempts was brief, in part because the West banked on a larger and stronger Poland facing the Bolshevik state. Ukraine was subsequently divided primarily between Poland and the USSR, so it was turned into a buffer zone between Europe and the Red Threat once again. The experience of statehood, however, became formative for Ukrainian subjectivity. It proved that Ukrainians were keen to share not only national identity, cultivated in opposition to imperial oppression, but also a common polity, something they have, they have continued to strive towards ever since. The Bolsheviks defeated the young state, but the resistance they encountered on the Ukrainian lands made them realize that while shaping the union of Soviet republics, they had to recognize Ukraine's desire for autonomy. And like the Tsars before them and Putin now, the Bolsheviks knew Ukrainians had a clear sense of self and would not accept being treated as a variant of a Russian nation. In the 1920s, the Bolsheviks looked for ways to control the Ukrainian manifestations of nationhood through policies such as indigenization, allowing cultural expression that was Ukrainian in form, but Soviet in content. The Soviet policy of indigenization encouraged the use of local languages, and it was a pragmatic step on the, on the, on the part of Moscow to better disseminate Soviet ideology to its multi-ethnic territories. However, it facilitated the growth of local cultural expression that was socially challenging, aesthetically experimental, and politically provocative. Ukrainian culture flourished in the 1920s, and this unruly homegrown culture expo exposed the hypocrisy of the USSR, where all nations were equal, but some were more equal than others. One of the writers of this period was Mykola Khvilovy who was of a Ukrainian-Russian background and had fought in the Red Army in the Civil War. A convinced communist, he opposed the cultural dogmas imposed by the Kremlin and worked, worked with his fellow writers to shape a fresh Ukrainian literature that looked towards Europe and away from Moscow. In 1926, commenting on Khvilovoy's position in a letter to Lazar Kaganovich, who was the first secretary of the Communist Party of the Ukrainian SSR, at the time Stalin wrote the following. 
What is to be said of other Ukrainian intellectuals, those of the non-communist camp, if even communists begin to talk, and not only talk, but even to write in our Soviet press in the language of Khvilovy, end of quote. Witnessing Ukrainian cultural activists repressed one by one, Khvilovy shot himself in 1933. The flourishing of Ukrainian culture led to the thriving of national consciousness and further mobilization against the center that tried to oppress it. The answer from the center was more oppression. Stalin halted the indigenization experiment and opted for the methods that gained him his notoriety, destroying all who stood in his way. For Ukraine, it meant the destruction of the political and cultural elites in the purges, as well as millions of peasants in the Holodomor, the artificial famine of the 1930s. The lack of sovereignty meant that during the Holodomor, Stalin made man-made man man famine, and during the repressions and murder of intellectual elites, Ukrainian voices were not heard. Perceiving the country as something legitimately within Russia's sphere of influence meant trusting the voices that spoke from Moscow. This created fertile ground for Ukrainians like other non-Russian non peoples who dared to demand autonomy to be systematically repressed, russified, and denied subjectivity. During the Second World War, Ukraine once again found itself as a buffer zone. And I'd like to po pause a little longer on the question of the Second World War, because Russia weaponized this part of history a lot more than any other since the start of its aggression against Ukraine in 2014. And because there are things that can be learned from the experience of the Second World War that might help us um, see contemporary events a bit more clearly. Like with the history of Ukraine, the history of the Second World War on the Eastern Front has often been read through the Russian lens. The Ukrainian dimension, therefore, is now only the way that Moscow has presented it, belittled and very frequently twisted. The USSR is conflated with Russia, so the Soviet victory is presented as Russian. In addition, it is Russia that is presented as an absolute victim, but not Ukraine, the territory of which suffered multiple occupations for the entire duration of the war. In 1939, the Red Army marched into Western Ukraine, Eastern Poland at the time, under the pretext of liberation. A local legend captures the arrival of the Soviets in 1939 through the words of a Lviv-based composer. He said, we've been liberated and it can't be helped. Of course, the Russians used the same pretext of liberation in 2014 and then again in 2022 when they attacked Ukraine. When the Soviets arrived to annex Western Ukraine in 1939, they, fought, they thought that they had come to the most impoverished territory to rescue Ukrainians who lived there. It's true, Galicia, Eastern Galicia was among the poorest parts of Poland, and Poland was among the poorest parts of Europe, but those who came from the USSR discovered that, they, that it was they that needed liberation, not Western Ukrainians, as the peasants that they encountered were so much better off than the army that came to rescue them. I thought of this episode a lot when I watched videos of the Russian army men looting washing machines and getting excited at the sight of Natalia Jar in Ukraine in the early weeks and months of the full-scale invasion. These were the liberators that needed liberation. Another observation from the Second World War is worth remembering that servicemen and servicewomen were perceived by the Kremlin as little more than cannon fodder. They were badly armed, badly trained, and seen as dip dispensable, something that we can perhaps discuss in the, in the Q&A section about contemporary use of um, service personnel by the Russians. During the Second World War, the perpetration of war crimes by the Red Army was seen as a legitimate method of war, um, as was evident from numerous mass rapes perpetrated by Soviet soldiers across Europe. We are witnessing very similar behavior in Russia's war against Ukraine today. Perhaps if those of us who study the region and the period focused more on studying Kremlin's techniques in the Second World War and less on facilitating the glorification of Russian victory, which in recent years has turned into a frenzy of celebrating violence, not only in Russia, but by the Russians in other parts of the world, in our capitals, in Europe, on the 9th of May, we'd be more prepared for the shocking images that we got to discover since the start of the full-scale invasion. Those who were familiar with the Katyn massacre, for instance, of 1940 by the NKVD were probably less surprised by the killing of Olenivka Ukrainian POWs by the Russians in July 2022. 
Those who have grieved their loved ones in the mass graves of Stalinist terror were less surprised at the sight of mass graves in Irpin, Bucha, and Izum. Those who have studied Soviet World War II filtration camps would have been less surprised at seeing them appear again in this war. And not only fil filtration camps, but also concentration camps, such as Isolatia, an art gallery that was turned into a, an, an, inf an infamous um, torture fortress soon after the city of Donetsk was occupied in 2014. It's still there. But let's come back to the perception of Ukraine as a buffer zone. After the Second World War, the territory of Western Ukraine that had been part of Poland and had put up fierce resistance to the Soviets was sacrificed by the Western allies to the imperialist ambitions of the Soviet Union. Stalin was allowed to keep the lands he annexed in 1939 as part of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. However, the destruction inflicted on Ukrainians in the 1930s or the devastation suffered during the Second World War did not result in the destruction of the nations striving for sovereignty. Each subsequent generation found its own route to an anti-imperialist struggle. The 1960s witnessed a booming dissident movement that positioned the protection of human rights at its center. It continued to resist Russification of Ukraine and fought for a national self-expression. When it came to dealing with dissent, the post-Stalinist leaders of the Kremlin might not have shot as many people as their predecessor did, but they were happy to lock up writers, artists, and poets in psychiatric asylums and in prison camps. And when in the 1980s the world was cheering Soviet reforms such as perestroika and glasnost, Ukrainian dissidents continued to be persecuted. Vasil Stus, one of the finest Ukrainian poets who was raised in Donetsk, perished in a Russian prison camp in 1985, where he was sent for his dissident activism against the oppression of the Ukrainian language and culture. While imprisoned, he wrote more than 300 poems in Ukrainian. His life is an ultimate example of defiance. In January 2023, Stus would have turned 85 if he had lived if he hadn't been killed by the Soviet machine four decades earlier. One of the willing cogs in that machine was someone called Viktor Modvichuk, known for being Putin, one of Putin's closest allies in Ukraine. So close that he chose the Russian president as a godfather to his daughter. Back in 1980, Medvedchuk was appointed a defense lawyer to Vasil Stus, in spite of Stus's objections to his choice. And his defense consisted of confirming to the court that Stus's crimes deserved punishment. Street art with Stus's face and the hashtag Medvedchuk we've not forgotten periodically appeared on the streets of Kiev to remind the former Soviet lawyer that Ukrainians, unlike his friend in the Kremlin, knew and remembered their history. In April 2022, Medvedchuk, who went into hiding following the full-scale invasion, was discovered and arrested. In September 2022, he was exchanged for the defenders of Mariupol in a prisoner swap. In January 2023, just four days after Stus's birthday, he was stripped of Ukrainian citizenship. Putin might choose to continue dismissing Ukraine's history, but his friend's fate should serve as a good reminder that Ukrainians will never forget their past, neither distant nor recent. And just as the previous empires collapsed, so did the Soviet variant. In 1991, a week before the Soviet Union ceased to exist, 92% of Ukrainian voters, which is just under 30 million people, over 80% of, um, of uh, the voting population, supported the declaration of independence in a national referendum. The USSR was dissolved a week later. Statehood was at long last restored. This, however, did not release Ukraine from the buffer zone um, entirely. Having gained independence, Ukrainians did not acquire the voice necessary to be taken for an equal and not a mere object in international discussions. The removal of nuclear weapons from Ukraine and the inherent weakness of the Bud Budapest Mem Memorandum on security uh, assurances widened the security gap in the middle of Europe. It is very articulately described by Sergei Plochy in his recent book on Russo-Ukrainian war. And this once again placed Ukraine in the buffer zone, which in 2014 and then again in 2022 was inevitably turned into a war zone. Ukraine's unambiguous desire to leave Russia's imperial embrace 
in the 1990s was not welcomed by the Russians, including those who had themselves suffered from the repression of the USSR. Because being anti-Soviet and being pro-Ukrainian are very different things, as the case of Joseph Brodsky demonstrates. A Russian poet, a dissident who was forced out of the USSR in the 1970s and settled in the US, he taught at major American universities and in 1987 was awarded the Nobel Prize in the Literature. In 1991, he was appointed United States Poet Laureate. In the same year, the Ukrainians made their political choice clear. He wrote a poem entitled On Ukrainian Independence. You can read it in full online. I will only recite one verse from that poem in my rough translation, but I think you should get an idea. Godspeed, Cossack eagles, hetmans, and gulag servants. But when your time will come to die, you animals, you'll be croaking while grabbing onto your deathbed lines from Alexander and not the lies of Taras. The Alexander whom Brodsky summons in these hate-filled verses is, of course, Alexander Pushkin. The Taras in the poem is Taras Shevchenko, I've already mentioned earlier. Incidentally, when in September 2022, the city of Balaklia in the Kharkiv region was liberated by the Ukrainian armed forces, a group of soldiers tore down a billboard, you can see the, the stills on the side here, depicting the Russian flag and the slogan, we are one nation with Russia. And underneath that poster was another, predating the occupation. It depicted a portrait of Taras Shevchenko and his famous lines from his poem, The Caucasus. Boritese, poborete, vam boh pomohaye, za vas pravda, za vas slava, i volja svetaje. Keep fighting and you will prevail. God himself will aid you. Truth and glory stand beside you and the holy freedom. Incidentally, at the same time, Billboards depicting Alexander Pushkin have been spreading around Ukrainian cities together with the occupation, thus becoming a symbol of aggression, destruction, and death. As the past 19 months and three decades before that and a couple of centuries before that have demonstrated no matter how hard the Russians try to get Ukrainians to read Alexander, it's always Taras who peeks through the cracks of the dilapidated empire. Accepting Russia's weaponized version of history and viewing the whole region through Moscow's eyes has led to denying credibility to the voice of those with experiential knowledge of oppression. It has also led the world to misjudge the oppressor, to normalize him and give him validity on the international scene, while depriving the same validity to the oppressed. Ukraine, a nation of 40 million, was perceived as a small nation, and why explore the culture or the politics of a small nation when you can learn all about it from its great neighbor? A country that has seen regular popular, um, regular popular anti-authoritarian movements and held several free elections um, during just three decades of independence was perceived as corrupt, while Russia, the state that has had the same ruler in power for over 20 years, was engaged with in business and politics. And if that is the view we held of the region on the eve of Russia's full-scale invasion, it is little wonder why Ukraine was perceived to fall within days. It's probably worth reminding ourselves that that was the perception, um, that it, you know, Ukraine was given between three days and, and a week or so to fall. Ukraine has been fighting the war against Russia for nearly 10 years. And during this time, it has democratically elected one president, voted him out, and elected another. It introduced a series of significant reforms, some of which have had more success than others. Its civil society, historically strong and reignited by the Maidan protests, put in place grassroots movements that brought about much social change and kept the pressure on the political elites to continue reform. The armed forces were transformed largely with the help of a vast volunteer movement from a barely functioning army eroded by corruption and Soviet legacy to a motivated, well-trained, and much better equipped fighting force that we're observing today. And all of these changes came into existence in times of war. It is the historical experience of statelessness and struggle, repressive external rule, and hard-won independence that has shaped Ukraine into the nation that we see today opposed to imperialism, united in the face of the enemy, and determined to protect its freedom and ensure security and peace, not only on its own lands, but also in the rest of Europe. 
Because of its history as a divided borderland between multiple states and empires, Ukraine has always been a melting pot of cultures, languages, and traditions. The result of that intermingling is the modern Ukrainian political nation, members of which speak Crimean Tatar, Romanian, Hungarian, Bulgarian, and many other languages in addition to Ukrainian. And as a viral meme from the start of the invasion showed, all of them can tell a Russian warship exactly where to go in Russian. Russia's war is aimed at destroying Ukraine, but it is also aimed at creating a world where might is always right, where irredentism paves the way to aggression, and where human rights violations and war crimes go unpunished. It is the citizens of Ukraine who are currently resisting Russia on the battlefield, but Russia's world, world order that could threaten our freedoms wherever we are is being resisted by all of us around the globe. And I would like to end my talk by paying tribute to Victoria Amelina, Ukrainian writer, poet, and fighter for justice. Since the start of the full-scale invasion, she was dedicated to documenting Russian war crimes. It is a death that now documents one such crime. On the 27th of June, 2023, Victoria was in Kramatorsk, eastern Ukraine, in a pizza restaurant with a group of fellow writers when a Russian missile struck um, the restaurant, which was full of civilians. The attack took Victoria's life, together with those of another 12 people, including three children. And it was highly praised by the head of the Russian, defense, uh, Russian Duma Defense Committee, Committee. Speaking on Russian TV, he said the following, the strike on Kramatorsk was a real beauty. I bow my head to those who planned it. Not a blow, but a song. My old military heart rejoices." End of quote. Victoria's heart did not stop immediately. Paramedics and doctors fought for her life, and she died on the 1st of July, 2023. Documenting stories of people she met in liberated territories found, Victor, uh, while documenting these stories, Victoria found a diary written by the writer and poet Volodymyr Vakulenko. He had buried it in his garden before he was kidnapped and murdered by the Russians in the first months of the full-scale invasion. His body was found in a mass burial site when the Ukrainian armed forces liberated Kharkiv region. Victoria made sure that the world knew Vakulenko's story, posting a selfie that you can see here with the diary rolled up and tightly wrapped in a plastic bag. She wrote the following. The diary of Volodymyr Vakulenko, as I found it back in Ukrainian soil on the 24th of September 2022, exactly half a year after Volodymyr had hidden it, before being abducted and killed by the occupiers. I keep telling myself the story of Volodymyr has nothing to do with me, but it does. On the 22nd of June, 2023, five days before the Kramatorsk shelling, Victoria spoke at the book ar arsenal, Kiev's major literary festival, at the launch of Vakulenko's diary. But Vakulenko's memory lives, she wrote afterwards. In 2021, she set up a New York literature festival, not in New York, USA, but in a village with the same name in the Donetsk region, a place where her husband spent some of his childhood. I really wanted to be the founder of a literary festival in New York, she joked when she spoke in London. In reality, she was passionate about bringing Ukrainian culture and literature to the least accessible parts of Ukraine and did that with great success. Her death was caused by injuries incompatible with life. That was a line from the statement issued by Penn Ukraine informing of Victoria's death. The first time I read this phrase was on a document issued by a military medical commission to my brother, Volodya. His injuries too were incompatible with life. He was a soldier of the Ukrainian armed forces killed in action in 2017 near Popasna, a town 70 kilometers northeast of New York. And if you were driving from one to the other, you'd go via Bakhmut. These once obscure place names of Eastern Ukraine are now known all over the world. We recognize them because the Russians have raised them to the ground. There's no Popasna left. Bakhmut looks like a post-apocalyptic wasteland. New York is still holding up, but no literary festival will be held, held there anytime soon. As with the towns that are no more, the world is learning names of Ukrainian writers from their obituaries, and that is no way to discover the country's literature. 
We must bear witness to Victoria's death, like she bore witness to that of Vakulenko and many more killed in Russia's war. And we must remember that bearing witness comes with responsibility to ensure justice. And that is the responsibility we must embrace. And just to finish my talk, I am reminding myself and all of us that the theme of this symposium is war and peace. So I'd really like to ask us all to question ourselves about the meaning that we apply to both of those concepts. I've been studying wars as a scholar for quite a while, and it's not like I was unfamiliar with the complexities of political violence. But the current war against Ukraine made me re-examine the meaning of war. It made me shift my focus somewhat from violence perpetrated by the invading army to the resistance of the defending nation, the entire nation in the case of Ukraine. This war has engulfed Ukrainian society as a whole. Almost 80% of the population, according to the recent survey, knows someone, either a member of the family or, some, or a close friend, who's been either killed or injured in Russia's war against Ukraine. For Ukrainian, the political is as personal as it gets. Collective action, of course, must also be considered alongside collective inaction. This war made me re-examine the meaning of neutrality. Can one really claim to be neutral in a genocidal war? Wasn't the seeming neutrality of the Western world, the, the Western world kept for the first eight years of Russia's war a factor that facilitated the escalation of the conflict in 2022? I'd also like us to revisit the word peace. No one wants peace more than Ukrainians. But this word has become highly problematic for us. Because peace without justice, without deoccupation, restoration of territorial integrity, and appropriate security guarantees, without ensuring that Russia cannot wage another war, is merely a ceasefire that will benefit the Russian army and allow the continuation of the war. Peace at any cost will prolong the occupation that has come with torture chambers and mass graves. We saw them in the Russian-occupied territories for the first eight years of the war, and then again on a wider scale since the start of the full-scale invasion. We, here in the West, continue to say never again in an illusion that our post-Second World War security architecture would guarantee peace. We now know that it failed the Ukrainians in 2014, and it failed the rest of us in 2022. Europe will not be secure until there's lasting peace in Ukraine. There won't be lasting peace in Ukraine for as long as Russia enjoys impunity and benefits from the war crimes that it is perpetrating. So if we want to ensure peace, we need to ensure justice. Thank you.